Amen. So keep your place in 1 Corinthians. Uh, my, keep your place in 1 Corinthians 11. And we're going to start a new sermon series this morning, and we're going to do a three-part series for the next three weeks on Sunday mornings. I don't usually have a, a series on Sunday mornings, but we're going to have one for the next three weeks, and it's going to be on the family and the structure of the family, which is being covered in 1 Corinthians chapter. 11. So we're going to basically, this three-part series, if I had a title for it, it would be called The Household. And we're going to talk about the parts of the household. We're going to talk about the men today. We're going to talk about the women next week. And then we'll talk about the children um, in the week following. So let me say first about the sermon this morning. Um, we're first going to focus on the men. So um, this is going to be one of those sermons this morning, and it may be for the whole series, that you probably won't hear um, at many other churches. Okay, so that's the first warning I want to give you. The second thing I want to say this morning is if I could give, uh, go around giving out free passes to all the ladies this morning, I would do so. So ladies, this sermon this morning, look, you have no right to be offended this morning, ladies, because I'm not talking to you. Okay, this, this morning I am talking to the men. So ladies, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Okay? So, men, you know, maybe I should have told you 10 minutes ago so you had the opportunity to leave if you wanted to. Okay? But let me just say that um, this is about the men this morning. So it's a three-part series. Look, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is laying out the structure of the family. Okay? And the structure of the family is something that you don't see talked about um, much anymore at all. Um, you know, it's pretty much everybody's in charge, everybody's, uh, you know, has equal say. You know, even, you know, you even find in families, uh, worldly families today, that it's the wife and the husband and the children all ruling together. You know, everyone's supposed to have equal say in everything, but that is not what the Bible teaches at all. So we're going to talk about that this morning, and I'm going to make it very simple for the guys this morning. Um, I'm going to make uh, this sermon this morning is a litmus test for you. So if you think, you know, am I talking to you? Well, first of all, if you're a man in charge of a family, if you're a man and has a family this morning, I am talking to you. Okay, but this sermon this morning, I want to give you some specific details where you can compare yourself and say, is this something that I need to work on? I'm going to give you some actual details that you can look at from the Bible reflect that onto your family and say, you know, am I doing things right in this area? Now, men, with a biblical church, you know, the Bible does teach that the man's in charge, and, you know, you'll see a lot of men, especially young men, that really like this. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, they look at this whole thing like the Bible, I'm in charge, they say. When what they should be doing is they should be reading what the Bible says about the family, about the structure of the family, not just in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but many other places in the Bible. And they should be saying, oh man, I'm in charge, is the way they should be looking at things. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3. It's the verse of the week. It's also on your bulletin. The Bible says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. So, men, you are clearly in charge of your family. You are the head. Even the IRS knows this. You are the head of your household. There's actually a, a, a way you can file your taxes called head of household. Look, men, the Bible says that's you. That you are in charge. You are in charge of the family. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to just focus in on verse number 5 for now, but I want you to keep your place in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 is talking about the qualifications for somebody that wants to go into the ministry, the qualifications for a pastor, for a bishop, for someone that wants to lead a church. And look at verse number 5. The Bible says this, So men, you're in charge of your household. You are the head of your wife, meaning you are in charge of your wife. Yes, that's what the Bible says. If you get married, the man is supposed to be in charge. That is God's plan. You're not going to hear that much anymore, but that's what the Bible says, and that's what we will teach and preach here always. 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 5. The Bible says this. We're talking about the qualifications of someone that could be a pastor. Think about how serious this is. For if a man know not how to rule his own house... 
How shall he take care of the church of God? You men are supposed to rule your house. That means you're supposed to be in charge of your family. You're in charge of your wife and children. You are the boss. So this morning's sermon, again, it's a litmus test. It's a litmus test. One way or the other, the goal of this morning's sermon is to find out whether or not you are in charge of your home. Next week, look, next week we'll focus on the wives and their role in the home. And then the following week we'll focus on the perspective of the children. But this morning, we're talking to the men. So I want to give you some signs this morning. Some signs that you are not leading your home according to the Bible. You're in charge. You say, what am I in charge of? You're in charge of everything. First of all, you're in charge of spiritual matters in your home. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to get specific with you this morning. The first couple, a couple are going to be easy because I don't really think that you know, they apply to too many men in this room. But look at um, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and look at verse number 1. Look what the Bible says. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. Telling Timothy, look, you must preach the word. He's talking to someone who's going to be a young pastor. He's saying, look, you must preach the, the, the Bible. Well, why would I have to tell him that? Because of um, verse number 3. For the time will come, well, they will not endure sound doctrine. He's telling Timothy, you must preach the Bible. It's kind of like this morning. You must preach the Bible even when people don't want to hear it. You must preach the doctrine even when they don't want to hear sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So, you know, they'll want to he heap to themselves people that tell them what they want to hear. They want to heap to themselves people that tell them, you know, what the problems of everybody else out there are. What everybody else's issues and never focuses on them. Itching ears. Tell me how bad everybody else is and how great I am. That's what people want. Verse number four. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Look, men, it is your job. Sign number one that you are not leading your family is if you don't decide where you go to church. If there is a man who does not decide where his family goes to church, that is a man who is not leading his home. Because people, people, and especially before a church, before, this is a sign I've seen over and over and over again, when a church goes liberal, you'll find, you show me a liberal church and I'll show you where the women are, are leading. I'll show you where the wives are leading their husbands. It, look, it's just a matter of fact. It's just the way it, it happens. The men are supposed to lead their families in this way, and they are to decide. They are to keep, look, even when there's, you know, they're hearing things that aren't itching their ears, they are to go to a place and bring their family to a place where the truth is being preached. Where what? Sound doctrine is being preached. And, and they're, they're supposed to be guarding against you know, their family, whether it be their wives or their children, wanting to turn their ears away from the truth, away from that sound doctrine. Whether it's in season or out of season, you lead your family to a biblical church and you go there. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. So sign number one, if you don't decide where you go to church, you are not leading your home. Period. Sign number two, if you don't decide when you go to church, you are not leading your home. Turn to Hebrews 10, look at verse number 25. The Bible says this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It is your job, men, to decide when you go to church. And according to the Bible, you should be in church when the church assembles. So it is your job to lead your family in that direction. And look, I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm not just going to give you all the problems you have this morning. I'm going to show you how to solve them too. Okay? I'm not here to just, you know, tear you down and, you know, tell you all the problems that you have. I'm here to look at the Bible because the Bible tells you how to solve these problems too. So, in spiritual matters in general, whether it comes to the church, where you go to church, when you go to church, that's your job. That's your responsibility. 
When I, when I see, you know, somebody that doesn't come to church, a family that doesn't come to church, look, that is nobody's fault but the man. Amen. Period. That's what the Bible says. Matters of the home. Look back at 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Actually, go to 1 Timothy 3. I'll just read again for you 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But I'd have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. The man is in charge of the home. 1 Timothy chapter 3, I already read for you verse 5, but I want to read for you verse number 4 as well. Look at verse number 4 of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now we are talking about the qualifications for a man who is going to be a pastor of a church. And the Bible says, one that ruleth well his own house. Look, that says that this man, if he wants to be a pastor, he better rule his house well. You know what rule means? That means be in charge. That means lead his house. And have, uh, whoa, there's more detail. Uh-oh. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. You know what that means? Seriousness. It means it's a serious thing. Look, the qualifications that you say, I'm not going to be a pastor. Listen, the qualifications of a pastor apply to you too. Did you know that? All this is saying in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is it is giving biblical doctrine and it is saying, look, this, will cut, this is a job you can't have if you don't follow these things. You can't have this particular job of being a pastor if you don't follow these things. It's not saying that everybody shouldn't follow them. Right. It, or, or it's saying if you're a pastor and you don't, look, if you're, if you're a, a layman, a member of a church, or you're just a saved Christian and you don't follow these commands, look, there's consequences that are coming for you. There's consequences that are coming for your family. However, in this particular case in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it's saying, look, these particular things, if you don't do them, can cost you your job. They can cost you, because look, if I'm in a job, and I'm all of a sudden no longer qualified for that job, can I stay in that job? Look, I have seen, and you have all seen, men who are pastors, many different men who are pastors, who violate or go against these qualifications, maybe these specific ones or other ones, and it costs them their job. That's what it's talking about. But look, but they still apply to all of us. You must rule your house well, having your children in subjection with all gravity. Now this is what I want to talk about right here. I'm going to rabbit trail this thing for about 10 minutes because I want to explain the gravity of this situation to you. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 21 because I want to do a little bit of a Bible study on disobedience. That means, look, if my children are not in subjection to me, it means they're disobedient to me. It means they're being disobedient. And I think, look, I think you all know what disobedience is. I'll give you some specific examples. However, I, I, am, I am pretty convinced that you all don't know how serious it is. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. I'm, 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 I'm very convinced that with many people, especially the men of this church, that it is the seriousness of disobedience is at least underestimated. Look at Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. Let's look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father. I mean, we're starting to... I mean, I'm going to... I want to explain to you the gravity of the situation. I'm going to keep using that word. Then shall his father and mother lay hold of him and bring him out unto the elders of this city, unto the gate of this place. You're not going to hear this anywhere else, by the way. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This is our son. This our son is stubborn and rebellious, and he will not obey our voice. He's disobedient. He won't listen to what his parents are saying. Now, I mean, we're assuming this is a, you know, a grown, um, young adult child, or I don't know how old he is, but they, the Bible continues, he is a glutton and a drunkard. Underline that. And, with all the, and all the men of the city shall spank him. No. All the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear, and what? And fear. Now everyone's like, oh man, they executed kids in the Old Testament. 
Well, first of all, I mean, you know, I'm thinking we're dealing with a young adult here, but this is a, this is a rebellious young adult that will not obey and is a drunkard and glutton. And I don't think that this had to happen much because basically the end of verse 21, the whole point was to, you know, make this not happen. So people would fear. They would hear and they would fear. But my point I'm trying to make is, is that disobedience is a grievous sin in the Bible. A disobedient child, look, a disobedient child at a young age will lead to outright rebellion at an older age that we're looking at in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Turn to Titus chapter 1. You say, that's Old Testament. You see, you see the, the, the seriousness, or what, what's that word? The gravity of disobedience. Look at Titus chapter 1 and verse 16. So disobedience is, is not a small thing, and the New Testament does not, I mean, you're going to see how this all matches up with the New Testament and how serious it talks about disobedience. They profess that they know God, verse 16, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. These people are rejected from God, and the word disobedient is used there. Turn to, turn to uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 30. We're talking about reprobates, people that have been rejected by God. They've been given up by God. They're done. The worst type of people. Yes, it's possible. It's possible. Look at verse 30 of Romans 1. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. You see how serious this is? When disobedience of children is listed in the, a description of the worst type of people. Now, I mean, do you understand how the gravity of the situation of a disobedient child? Am I getting through to you? Moms, relax. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the men. Turn to Proverbs 23. Now knowing this, now knowing the gravity of the situation, Proverbs 23 makes perfect sense. Proverbs 23 makes perfect sense. When you realize, when you realize that if you raise a disobedient child and they grow to a disobedient adult and, and you see what happens in Deuteronomy, I mean, that's why that punishment was so serious in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Because God knows how serious that sin is. Because God knows what it leads to. Now it makes perfect sense in Proverbs 23 when the Bible says in verse number 13, it says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. You know what that's, you know what that's, that's implying? That if you don't beat him with the rod, he may die. He will die. You see, it's a life and death situation. This disobedience. Proverbs 23, look at verse 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and thou shalt deliver his soul from hell. I mean, we're talking about physical life and death and salvation. It's bringing up hell. It's bringing up death. Look, this is what could be at stake. Do you understand the gravity of the situation now? Disobedience is serious. And look, I'm telling you, men, I see it here. Oh! I see disobedient children here. I see it here. This sin exists here. So, sign number three that you're not leading your home. Men, if you have disobedient children, you are not leading your home. I, I, I'm sorry to hit you in the face with the truth this morning, but if you have disobedient children, you are not leading your home. You say, what are, what are signs of disobedience? I'll give you specific signs. What are signs of disobedience? Kids that say no to you. This one shocks me every single time I see it. There is no better example of in-your-face disobedience men than a child that will say no to you. That is a child rebelling against you. Do you understand? If you tell your child to do something or to not do something and they say no, that is rebellion that you are dealing with. Look, them, them not doing it 
If you say, hey, stop doing that, or hey, do this, and they don't follow that command, that's disobedience. Them saying no to you is rebellion. That is rebellion. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. Look, I'm trying to get across the gravity of the situation to you this morning. Because just because you see everybody else out in the world, you know, dealing with this and doing things this way and parenting this way, forget that. Forget that. They're going to deal with consequences that you don't want to deal with. So you must do things different if you want different results. Look at Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor thy father and mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord giveth thee. Again, showing the seriousness of children obeying their parents. Now, here's some irony for you. Here's some irony for you. Children, you know, look, kids that say no to their parents are the same kids whose parents never say no to them. Isn't that ironic? But I've just noticed that. I've just noticed that over the years. That, you know, parents that never say no to their kids are the same parents that have their kids saying no to them. So men, here's an experiment for you. Here's an experiment for you. Go an entire day saying no to everything your kids ask for. Okay, I mean, I mean don't, don't get me wrong. Feed them, clothe them, teach them, take care of them. But everything that they ask for, say no. I mean, do you, I mean, do, do people, I mean, do people here really think that giving your kids everything they want is the answer? I mean, what in the world? I mean, you make me feel like I haven't been doing a good job here, if that's what you think. I mean, there is no way, I mean, nobody thinks that. Nobody thinks that in their head. No father in here thinks that I should give my kids everything that they want and that's the right thing to do. Yet, why do you do it? So why do you do it then? You know, here, here's another test. Here's another test for you. When, you. when you give your kids a command, one time, do they do it? When you give your kids, dads, I'm just talking to the dads, moms, relax. Dad, when you give your kids a command, stop doing that. Does it stop? Once. If not, you have a disobedient child. I know we have this here because I am constantly seeing parents beg their kids to stop doing things or to do things. When, uh, don't, oh, don't, don't. Don't do that. Instead, you know, you got, instead you want to try to find something more fun for them to do and get them to stop doing what they're doing. You're trying to convince them to obey you. No. No. It's not about convincing them to obey you. Stop doing that. Why? Because that's what I said. And I'm your dad. That's it. That's how simple it is. It's not that complicated. It's way more complicated to try to go up and have to try to convince a two-year-old or three-year-old or four-year-old or five-year-old to, hey, um, don't do that, or you know, do this, or, or constantly you know, bribing them with something. I mean, this is horrible. Bribing them with food, that's even worse. Notice in Deuteronomy 21, by the way, notice, what were the two things? What were the two things this kid, this young adult that's about to be executed by the tribe of Israel, what were his sins that they listed? Gluttony and drunkenness. You know why those two sins were listed? It's because it's, this is why. Because that is the child with no self-control. That is a child who has never been taught what no means. That is a child that has never been taught to obey their parents. So instead, they're bribed with food and whatever else, fun things and all this. I mean, first of all, like half the kids in this church are going to be diabetic before they're 30. It's not funny. You're never going to go on a hike like we did yesterday when you're 50 if you're diabetic when you're 30. It's ridiculous. Bribing them with food, you're going to turn them into gluttons. And those two things go together, drunkards. Because they have no self-control. Oh, I want to eat this. No self-control. Men, it's your fault. It's your fault. It's, I mean, look, it's... You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta say no to them. You gotta say no to them because it teaches them to control themselves. 
So when they get older and they realize, oh man, I just can't eat Big Macs every day. Or, I'm a, I mean, if I ate Big Macs every day, I'd be a huge guy up here. I'd be like, Burr. there's no way we'd be going on hikes like that. I'd be like, we're going to get together, do a men's activity, and we're going to take a nap together at the church. <laughs> we're going to get a bunch of couches, and we're going to lay on it and eat Cheetos. That's what we'd be able to do. You teach your kids to eat Big Macs all the time or whatever you, you know, you're, you're bribing them with and all this kind of stuff, and then they're, they're huge. I mean, they're, you know, you're going to ruin their life. It's serious stuff, folks. Look, and so when I see parents around here that, that are putting up with this and they're trying to convince their kids to obey them, I, I know, I, look, it, when I see a man doing it especially, it makes me die a little bit inside. Because I can't believe it. I mean, why are you not leading? Why are you not disciplining your children? I mean, why am I not seeing a stream of, of parents constantly going in the back and spanking their kids? I mean, why am I not seeing that? You know, I mean, it's just, look, wait, here's another sign. Let me give you another sign. When your kids don't listen to other adults, that's a sign of a disobedient child. When I'm out soul winning, and, you know, a parent is giving the gospel, and I try to, you know, men look, we're not big on, we're not really big on, on telling other people's kids what to do here. I, I, that's a good culture to have. However, when we're out soul winning and someone's, you know, parent is giving the gospel, and I, you know, try to talk to the child, say, hey, shh, you know, quiet or whatever, and they, you know, they don't even hear what an adult says, I know they don't take you seriously. I know if they don't take other adults seriously, they just look right past you and just keep going. Look, I know that they don't take you seriously at home. Look, if my kids, I mean, if my kids didn't listen to me, I would go nuclear. Like, it's a huge, look, do you guys understand that if I would go and I would tell Garrett, you say, Garrett, he's, he's 19. You say, if I would go and I would tell him to do something, and he would say no, do you know that I couldn't be up here? That's how serious it is. He's 19 though, he's 18, and he can, he's an adult and he can do what he wants. Where does that say in the Bible? I mean, if I go and I tell Garrett, you know, you have to do this, you have to do 10 push-ups right now, and he doesn't do it, look, I'm, that, disqualifies me from being leading a ministry. But it's not reasonable that, you know, you had him do 10, whatever. He's not obeying me. So, I mean, I don't understand why that doesn't exist in other men. Why is that? Why do you not demand that obedience? You should. You should start demanding that kind of obedience. And especially with little kids, there's no reason, there's no reason that you have to explain yourself. Because dad said so. That's not fair. Life's not fair! That's another thing they need to learn. They do what you say because you said it. That's it. Instead, you, you spoil them and you beg them to listen to you. That is not leading. That is not leading. Back to signs of disobedience. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6. So if you have disobedient children, you are not leading your home, men. So don't say, oh, I'm the leader of my home. I'm the leader of this house. Look, if you have disobedient kids, you're not doing it. Look at Proverbs chapter 6. Here's another one. Here's another sign that your children are disobedient. Look at verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Notice how all these are very serious things. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Pretty serious sins right there. Hands that shed innocent blood is listed in the same sentence as lying. A heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies. Do you know that twice lying was mentioned there? Look, if you have children that lie to you, that is serious disobedience. That is a serious sin. If you have children, kids that lie are disobedient. Kids that lie are in serious sin. It's mentioned twice here. Here's another one. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. 
Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. I'll just read it for you. Look, kids that are disrespectful to adults. Kids that will just walk up to a bunch of adults that are talking and just interrupt them. Look, I mean, that needs to be taken care of because that is disobedience. That is a child that has no respect for their elders. And that is a child that, if you don't have respect for, like, once again, you don't have respect as a child for other adults, they don't have any respect for you. That's what that shows. So look, men, you know what you will have? Here's another sign that you're not leading your home. You know what you will have if you don't discipline your kids and you have disobedient children? You will have a stressed out wife. You show me a stressed out mom, and I'll show you a dad who's not leading every time. You show me, I mean, I mean, why is it that some women can have eight kids and it's totally fine, and some women have one or two and they're just like, they're just basket cases? It's because their kids are disobedient. It's because the men are not leading their homes. I mean, you take a man that's not leading his home, and then he goes and he has you know, eight kids that are all disobedient, I'll show you a disaster right there in the making. Look, I, I don't have to preach another sermon on spanking your kids, but look, you just need to start being a leader in this area. And you say, well, you know, I, I just don't know and all this. Well, here, let me just, let me just beg you now. If you're not going to think about your wife, you're not going to think about your kids, because look, you're literally delivering, delivering your kids from hell and delivering your kids from death. If I can't convince you that way, how about, how about for the church? How about, you know, just think about the church. It affects the church. I mean, a soul winning, I'm going to go out and I'm going to talk to pastor and I'm going to get us a circus tent. Because soul winning is turning into a circus. I'm going to get a, a car with a bunch of clowns and some monkeys. And, and some, you know, circus music because soul winning is turning into a circus around here. Because the kids are, they're, they're not listening. They're running around and it's, you know, they're playing with all this stuff. We're, look, we're giving the gospel to people here. I mean, what must I do to be what? To be saved from hell. We're, we're talking about people's eternal destination out there. And we got a circus going on. Let's get some clowns and monkeys. At least make it fun. Look, it, it's a horrible testimony for our church. It's a terrible testimony for the church. I mean, we're out there and we're trying to pitch a family integrated church. Hey, we have the kids in the church service. You know, these people from Verity Baptist Church, they showed up. I mean, their kids were just well behaved and disciplined. They have a family integrated church. The kids listen to the preaching. I mean, what in the world is having a bunch of kids running around like a bunch of animals harassing their pets and whatever else? What is that doing for the testimony of our church? We have a family integrated church. It's a circus there too. Come on, stop by. We got monkeys and clowns. Look, that's not the testimony that we're looking for. What about visitors when they come here? What are we saying to visitors when they come here and they see a bunch of undisciplined, disobedient children in this church? I mean, can you help me out with this? This is about the testimony of the church. Look, there's responsibility that comes with this family integrated church, folks. We do have the, 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 the kids. Look, you're held, look, we're in a Bible preaching church. We're preaching the Bible. Most of the stuff that I've read you this morning, nobody would ever mention. No, no preacher would ever be crazy enough to mention this kind of stuff. Okay? And, and look, look at the kids here. Look, we've got a lot of good kids here. Okay, I'm not trying to beat you into the ground, but the point is we're at a higher standard if we're following the Bible. We're at a higher standard here. We're at a higher standard. We're family integrated. The kids are here. That means we have to be up at this standard. Because it doesn't work following the Bible and preaching the Bible and having a family integrated church and not disciplining your children. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. Those two things, it's oil and water. It's not going to go together. Look, we're, we're, at a, we're at a higher standard. So, you are to lead your wife and children. And signs of that are if you know, you're not leading spiritually, you're not deciding when you go to church, you're not deciding where we go to church, you know, you're not leading your home, you have disobedient children, that's a sign you're not leading men. 
I gave you a bunch of signs of disobedient children. Look, you must lead here. You must, and, and like, you know, the, the, little, the little swat on the pants and stuff, just, just, just say you're against spanking. Because that's not it. Just, just be against spanking then. I mean, do it right. Just do it right. Look, you'll be less stressed out. Your wife will be very happy. Just do it right. You know, don't, don't fall into, I was just talking to, to uh, one of the kids the other day about this. Look, don't fall into emotionalism. That's your wife's job is to be an emotional being. It's not your job. Don't fall into emotionalism. That's, that's the California man. It's not you. That's not the Bible man. The emotionalism is, oh, but I don't want to spank him because look at how cute he is. Look, they're all cute! Okay? He's not going to be cute when he's 18 and he's punching you in the face. And you have no control over him. The, the man is, you know what? I, I came home from work and, and you know, I want to hang out with my, my three-year-old and four-year-old because these kids are awesome and they're good and all this. And I want to play football and i got to spank them? Oh, oh, but look at them. That's not a man, according to the Bible. You get the spanking done, you do it right to deliver his soul from hell. You do it right, you, you support your wife in that way, and, and, then, and then you go play football. And then you go do that stuff. I mean, that is a man. Don't fall into this emotionalism. You're a man. You do what you know you're supposed to do no matter how it makes you feel. That's what not being an, an emotional being is. I feel this way, but the Bible says this way, I go the Bible way. That's a man. And do it right. That's loving your kids, man. That's loving your wife, man. So you're to lead your wife and children. But you say, I told you I'd give you solutions, okay? You say, you say but no one will follow me. You say, but my, turn to 2 Kings chapter 10. I'm going to teach you how to fix this one too. Look, now if your kids, look, if your kids won't follow you, you're, you're not listening to what the Bible says, all right? You're not listening to what the Bible says. Look, if you got older kids that won't follow you, you raised them wrong. How's that? You got older kids that won't listen to you, you raised them wrong. It's that simple. Because you're not going to tell me that the Bible doesn't work for certain people. Wrong. You messed it up. But if you got little kids and they won't listen to you, you're not listening to the Bible. It's really easy to get a three-year-old to obey you, a four-year-old to obey you, a five-year-old to obey you, a six-year-old to obey you, a seven-year-old to obey you. Even an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, and ten-year-old, it's pretty easy to get them to obey you. But you never discipline them. Now when they're 11, 12, 13, this is why you hear so many people, by the way, like, I don't know, when they get to be teenagers, they just go crazy. Nah. It's because you raised them wrong. Did you have a Bible in there? No, they didn't. Because look, you're going to be one of those people. When your kids turn 12 and 13 and, you know, they just go crazy, it's because you raised them wrong. Because you didn't follow what the Bible says. I got two older children that have already been through crazy zone. Where's crazy zone? Where is it? Yeah, they change and they're different and things are different. And, and the corrections, you know, I mean, look, it's different parenting an older child. I get it. But if they go crazy on you and stop listening to you, you raise them wrong. Because the Bible works every time for every person. That's why the Bible is a miracle. The Bible is a miracle because it applies to everybody. It applies to everybody who's ever lived on planet Earth from the beginning to the end at every stage of their life. Show me another book like that. There isn't one. If it went wrong for you, it's because you, you decided, I'm going to go my way. Not the Bible way. You didn't heed biblical advice. It's that simple. Men, listen to what the Bible says and just do it that way no matter how you feel. Your wife, you say, my wife won't listen to me. It's like these, these, uh, these MGTOW idiots. You heard about these people? Men going their own way. It's a whole group of people out there. It's a whole group. There's so many groups of people I've never met until I moved to California. But, <laughs> The, the MGTOW idiots, right? They're like, oh, no, the laws, the laws say that, you know, the laws are, you know, towards the woman and all this, and, you know, these American women, they're not obedient and all this, you know, these are, so they're like, 
they're never going to get married, they're never going to have a relationship with a woman, and I'm not going to get into like probably what they do on the side of all that. But I mean, they're just anti-woman because they're like, no, I mean, these are, basically, you can sum these people up, they're a bunch of morons who couldn't get a puppy to follow them if they had a pocket full of dog food. That, that's, that's what sums these guys up. So you're like, man, how, how could, my wife, but she won't follow me. All right, let me explain something to you. And I'm pretty sure I can blanket state and statement this one for every woman in this room. Your wife wants to be led by a godly man. I can pretty much guarantee that. Now, especially for people, maybe they're saved later in life, and this, this Christian life, this separation, this, you know, going to church, maybe it's a, it's a big change. It's an actual lifestyle change for them. This is all new what to do. Look at 2 Kings chapter 10. Here's how you do it. Here's what you do. Here's the answer. How do we do it? He's like, my wife, you know, won't, you know, follow me. What is it? 2 Kings chapter 10, look at verse 15. Jehu is cleaning house here. Jehu is going, he is wiping out the house of Ahab. Jehu is not messing around. And he's going, and as he's in the middle of this task, 2 Kings chapter 15, he runs across someone. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right as my heart is right with the Lord? And Jonadab answered and says, It is. He basically says, are you with me? He's like, are you on my side? He's like, I'm going and I'm cleaning up the house of Ahab and Jezebel. You know, I'm taking care of this wicked family. He's like, are you with me? And Jonadab answered, it is. If it be, and then back to Jehu, if it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand and he took him up into the chariot. And he said, Jehu said, he said, come with me. He says, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. This is how you lead someone who is hesitant to follow. You show them your zeal. You show them your zeal. That's what you, you inspire them through your actions, is what you do. Look, many men can't get themselves off the couch, much less inspire others. Okay? But see, a good leader, look, a good leader, men, a good leader will take someone who is weak and make them strong. Right. You know what a bad leader will do? A good leader will take someone who is hesitant and make them confident. Right. A good leader will take someone who, who doesn't know, who doesn't know what to do, and they will show them the way. They will show them where to go. You notice what Jehu said. He says, come with me. He says, come with me, and I will show you the way, and I will show you what to do. He didn't say, is your heart with mine? Is your heart with mine, brother? Um, yeah, it is. It is. Oh, okay, great. What, what do you think we should do? What do you want to do about it? No, he says, he says, yes, my heart's with you. He said, come with me, and I'll show you the way, and I'll show you what to do through my actions. That is Jehu, how he inspired others. That's the way you need to be. You inspire others through your actions. And it works. Look, it works. You know what a bad leader does? A bad leader gets somebody that comes work for him, and maybe that person is struggling. I mean, let me just give you an employer example. Somebody that person is struggling, and I'm like, this idiot's not like me. This idiot can't do what, you know, do it this way. And then they mess up, and like, ah, no. A good leader says, come with me, and I will show you the way. And, 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 and through your actions, look, not the actions of the person who's coming with you, through your actions. You inspire that person to go from weakness to strength. To go from hesitancy to confidence. I mean, haven't you, I mean, haven't you ever been inspired by others? Think about a time, personally, everybody in your life, when you were inspired by somebody else. Not something you did, but you were inspired by somebody else. You, like, you saw somebody else do something great, and you're like, man, if they can do that, maybe so can I. Man, if they can do such a great thing and get those results, maybe, maybe that's possible for me to do that. That gives, I mean, people, inspiring others makes people think, it gives people hope and encouragement. Look, your wife, look, your wife wants you, listen to me, men, your wife wants you to lead and take charge. 
Let me give you an example. When I want to go out to dinner with my wife, when I want to go out to dinner with my wife, I don't call her up and say, hey, um, what do you think? Should we go out to dinner tonight? Where, do you, where would you like to go and all this? You say, this sounds like a normal conversation that an American man would have with, with his wife, right? Doesn't that sound like a normal conversation? Hey, honey, would you like to go out to dinner tonight? Um, where would you like to go? That's not how it goes. I call my wife because you know what will happen? You know where that conversation will lead? It'd be like, um, yeah, I don't know. I can cook. It'll save the money. She's smiling. It'll save the money. It's like, no, we're going out to eat. We're going to this place. Get in the car. Uh, you know what I'm doing? You know what I'm doing? Because I call her up and I say, no. I was like, you're not cooking tonight. We're going to this place. We're going out to eat. You know what I'm doing? I'm showing her my zeal for her. I'm taking charge of the situation. I'm saying, I'm going out and I'm going to spend time with you and you have no say in it. Because if she had say in it, you know, she would, you know, well, we could save the money and she'd start thinking about other things and this and that. It's not that she doesn't want to, it's like women want you to lead. This is what I'm trying to get across. Get in the car. There's no choice. We're going out. This is what we're doing. Too many men, too many men think, you know, do what I say, woman. That's what it means to lead. Too many men think that. You know, good luck with that. First of all, we'll talk to the women next week. You know, if your husband says, do what I say, woman, you should do it. But that kind of leadership, look, it's, it's not going to work. I, I don't know what to tell you. You know, it's not going to work. You look, she should, she should follow you. But no, you need, to, you need to inspire her and show you her, you know, show her your zeal for her. Show, I mean, show her, show her your love for the Word of God. Show her, show her your love for the Word of God by implementing that on how you raise your children. Show her your love for your children, knowing that you will do what the Bible says, raising your children despite what your emotions tell you. Show her your love for her in that way. Show, show your love for the kids. Show her your, your zeal for well-disciplined kids. And you know what? If you show her your zeal for well-disciplined children, that will show her your love for her. Because she will, she will care. You know why? Turn to Proverbs 29, verse 15. Look, you've got to listen to what the Bible says. You've got to listen to these words in the Bible. Because every single answer is here. Turn to Proverbs 29, 15. If you show her your zeal for the Word of God and implementing that in your household that you rule, you will show her your love for her. And she will, look, she may not even know it's happening, but she will feel loved from that. She will feel it. Look at Proverbs 29, 15. Why? Why? Because when you're not ruling your house and you're not showing that you care about the Word of God. Look, you're showing, first of all, you're showing that you're a hypocrite if you're not implementing the Word of God in your home. And we know how that turns out from a, a couple weeks ago. But look at uh, verse 15 of Proverbs 29. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his whole family to shame. Wrong. A child left to himself, an undisciplined child, brings shame to his mother. I mean, you, do you want your wife to f be shamed? Do you want your wife to feel shame? I mean, you show me undisciplined kids, I'll show you a shamed and embarrassed mom. 100% of the time. And I mean, implement the Bible in your home. Show your wife your zeal for this life of God for this life that God wants you to have, for this way of ruling your home, show her that you're going to rule according to the way God says, and then, and then just show her and bring her with you. Pull her up into your chariot, and then, you know what, don't pull her up into your chariot and say, where do you want to go? Be like, hey, are you with me? Here you go. What are we doing? I don't know. Standing here? Pull her up into your chariot, and then... Show her where you're going to go. I mean, just imagine a man whose wife could convince him not to go to church. I mean, or, or to go to a lame church. Amen. I mean, this is a, you know what this is? 
This is a man with no zeal. You, and, and that's a man that is, that is leading no one, is what that is. It, it's not, look, folks, it's not about control. It's not about control. It's about inspiration, is what it is. And this is your job. I mean, so how did you fare on the, on the test this morning? Men. Too many men, too many men, they gain Bible knowledge. You know, they get Bible knowledge and, and they become super critical to other people. Yet they're failing in their fundamental responsibilities as men in the Bible. Look, lead, follow. You ever heard the, the, the statement, lead, follow, or get out of the way? Look, there's no choice. If you're a man who's in charge of a family, the Bible says lead. If you're going to say, I'm going to follow or get out of the way, fine. But that's not what the Bible says. And there's going to be consequences to going outside God's way. Every time. Now, go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. I didn't read this on purpose. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. We read Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 talking about going to church and assembling with the believers all the time. But look at verse 24. Again, this is Jehu. This is Jehu right here in the New Testament. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Provoke your family. Provoke your wife. Provoke. That means to inspire. That means to bring them up with you in your chariot and then move in the right direction is what it means. Look, Proverbs 29 says, if where, there, where there's no vision, the, the people perish. Look, if I pulled your wife, if my wife, if we talked to your wife, folks, and said, what is your husband's vision for your family? How many wives would say, uh, where's your vision for your family? Do you have one? Do you have a vision for your family? Do you have a vision for the, the health of your children? Do you have a vision for the education of your children? Do you have a vision for a biblical marriage? Do you have a vision for this? Because the Bible says if you have no vision, it's going to fall apart below you. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where, there, where a man has no vision. You know, the vision is where Jehu was going. You know, he pulled him up into the chariot. He was with him. He had him at that point. You can still wreck it if you don't have the vision of where to go. you got to know where you're going. And then, and then Jehu didn't say, here's another one. Jehu didn't say, we're going to go over to Ray, or Ahab's house and we're going to clean house and we're going to take care of this, this wicked royal family as God told me to do, and then didn't do it. He went and did it. Jehu had a vision. He brought Jonadab with him, and then he went and he executed the vision. You must have a vision. Look, provoke. Lead men. That is what you're supposed to do, and, and it's not about talking about it, it's about doing it. You know what, and, and you know what, you guys, you guys here, you guys know what to do. Don't tell me that you men here don't know what to do. You guys know what the Bible says. I've preached enough about this. You all read your Bibles. You've got to step ahead of the game. You know where to go. You know where to point the chariot. Pull your family up in the chariot and get moving. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, today. I thank you for this. Um, these, these verses, this story in the Bible, Lord, that you just... Uh